So if after Labor Day is when we're supposed to look at head-to-head election polling, after what point are we supposed to look at weather for the eclipse? I would say within three days. Within three days? I feel like Friday. Sounds right in my totally uneducated opinion. (laughs) I'm basing that on just a lifetime of looking at the weather report. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it gets more accurate the closer you get, obviously. Oh, okay. Thanks, Nathaniel. Good and hashtag analysis. Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. According to a 538 analysis, the current presidential candidates are the second least popular duo to run for president since pollsters started asking about presidential favorability in the 1970s. The least popular ever were Trump and Clinton in 2016, and that year, third-party candidates received 6% of the vote, the highest percentage since Ross Perot. So should we expect a similar third-party vote this year? And of the third-party options, who is actually gaining ballot access, which is, of course, the baseline for even being able to receive votes? We're going to talk about it. We are also going to take a look at how the parties are positioning themselves on the issue of abortion heading into the general election. The legality of the abortion medication mifepristone was challenged at the Supreme Court last week, an effort supported by Republicans. But according to one recent poll, a slim majority of Republican voters actually support the use of the medication. And the census is changing. For the first time in 27 years, the government is adding a category to the survey, Middle Eastern and North African. And race and ethnicity categories are going to be combined. So is this a good or bad use of survey design? Here with me to discuss it all is Senior Elections Analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Welcome to the podcast, Nathaniel. Hey, Galen. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Also here with us is politics reporter Kaylee Rogers. Welcome to the podcast, Kaylee. Hi, Galen. Hey, and also with us is Senior Elections Analyst Jeffrey Skelly. Hey, Jeff. Good morning, Galen. So before we dive into everything I just discussed, I actually have a surprise game of Guess What Americans Think, which I have not told you all about. So get ready, grab a piece of paper and a pen while I introduce the segment. In January, passengers on an Alaska Airlines flight were... Uh, shocked when a side panel of their Boeing 737 MAX 9 jet blew off, opening a gaping hole that sucked out phones and other items into the troposphere. Galen, this is not good for my flight anxiety. Yeah, well, can I just say, I'm taking Alaska Airlines in uh, in a couple of weeks, so... I double thanks, my medication Galen. to fly now. You gotta check the plane. Buckle in, y'all, buckle in, y'all. This is exactly what this segment is about. Since then, Boeing has faced increased scrutiny. A six-week audit by the Federal Aviation Administration found, quote, multiple instances of quality control failures by Boeing and one of its suppliers. Current and former Boeing employees have blamed the company's desire to make planes more quickly. So has coverage of Boeing's safety failures changed the way that Americans feel about flying? To answer that, we're going to turn to guess what Americans think. So here we go. Here's the first question. According to a March YouGov survey, what percentage of Americans say they are either afraid or at least bothered by flying? And to just clarify, because I know you love to clarify survey design here, the potential options that respondents could pick from are, how do you feel about flying? Afraid of it? Bothers you slightly? Don't know? Not at all afraid? And so for this metric, I'm asking you the combination of afraid of it and bothers you. All right, three, two, one, reveal. 36%. 47%. Okay, and Kaylee, what do you have? 63. All right, so Jeffrey's got it. It is 50% of Americans say that they are at least bothered by flying, and that breaks down to 20% who say afraid of it and 30% who say bothered by it, and 44% of Americans say they are not at all afraid, 6% don't know. Perhaps these are people who don't fly. All right, that's what people say now. The next question is, what did folks say to the same question back in January before this FAA investigation? 
All right, three, two, one, reveal. 47%. 50%. I said the exact same thing. Oh. oh, people are trying to be like coy here. They think I'm they think I'm really just messing with them. Like it hasn't changed at all. Well, okay. no, 41 is a change. It's gone up. Well, Kaylee's the only one who changed. Nathaniel guessed a higher number. No, I guess the same, 50%. Oh. Okay, Jeffrey also guessed my the same My guess is number. the same as my previous guess. <laughs> well, the points go to the more earnest response, which is Kaylee. 42% said back in January that they were afraid. You guessed 41%. All right, so folks, we're not actually going to play an entire game of Guess What Americans Think. Thank you for playing along. Jeffrey, Kaylee, you tied. I'm sorry, Nathaniel, your trophy is not in the mail. But here's my question. An eight-point shift percentage point shift from January to March on the question of how Americans feel about flying. And I told you the breakdown uh, before. So in terms of straight up afraid of it, back in January, 14% versus 20% now bothers you slightly. It was 28% versus 30% now. So overall, an eight point shift. Is that, where would you categorize this on the spectrum between noise and meaningful change in how Americans feel about flying? Well, what was the margin of error? It's usually like three something, I think, in YouGov polls. So like that seems that seems like a significant shift. I mean, well, it's it's not like huge in terms of magnitude, but it seems like it's like statistically significant. And that doesn't surprise me. You know, that was something that was in the news for for a bit. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that there were a few people who maybe it tipped over the edge. But uh, the overall picture of Americans views on flying hasn't significantly changed. But uh, but yeah, that sounds about right to me. I'd be curious to see how resilient this is, if it's just like a reaction to this news cycle and then goes back to the norm. Uh, but also, it se- it sounds just in that break that, that it, most of the movement was from people who were already uncomfortable with flying, and now they, they report that they actually are fearful, which isn't that surprising. You're already uncomfortable, and then you read these news stories about like, sometimes the door falls off, and like, you might be a little more scared. <laughs> Yeah, to Kaylee's point, I think that's exactly it is sort of the is there like a shock to public opinion that slightly has raised fears about flying, but will that just diminish and it will go sort of back to where it was like revert to the mean uh, in a few months if there are no further stories, no further uh, incidents and people just sort of return to the norm. Yes, that is a great point. And in fact, I have data to back up that suggestion. So this question has been asked going back at least 40 years. And we see two significant changes um, in this data. Well, I think you, okay, guess one. 9-11. So actually, that is not one of them, according to this data, at least. So, So the thing is that there was already an uptick in people afraid of flying, according to this data. And maybe they don't ask it frequently enough to really catch 9-11. But one of the biggest changes is actually in 1996, when a TWA flight crashed off the coast of Long Island, killing all 230 people on board. So we see a significant shift there that endures for a while. And it's only after 9-11 that we see that dissipate. Um we see another uptick in the number of people afraid or at least bothered by the idea of flying in March 2015. Is it that the flight, the Asian air flight that disappeared? So these happen around similar times. I think the the Malaysian air flight happened. Thank you. I think the Malaysian flight happened in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. I remember it had endless coverage, so... There was, that had endless coverage. Also, though, this 2015 flight, the German wings flight that was caused by a co-pilot deliberately flying the plane into a mountainside. And that led to a 30-year low in the number of Americans who said they were not afraid to fly at all. Um, So, but then it had reverted back up to most people not being afraid of flying uh, before this. Hey, it remains the safest way to travel. Uh, long distances. And I like to tell my lizard brain that uh, it doesn't work, but uh, it's still nice to put it out there. I I do think that's interesting because like, right, like in my lifetime, I feel like there have been kind of distinct eras of this. Like there was this time, I feel like in like the late nineties, early two thousands, right. When like plane disasters felt 
not common, but like they were in the news, right? There was TWA. I think there was like a, a Concord crash in like 2000 or something like that. There was obviously 9-11. Um, and, and there were things that kind of like, you know, dominated the news when they happened. But we're currently in the middle of like this like unprecedented streak of like air safety. Like there hasn't been a fatality in commercial uh, like air lining in the U.S. since 2009, which is like really like... I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but like should be like noted, I think. And, and it is interesting to see how um, the public opinion does and doesn't kind of match the, the statistics kind of in a way that's like similar to like other things like, you know, perception of the economy or like crime or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I'll say I used to be afraid of flying and I'm not anymore. And this I was not afraid of flying. Then I became afraid of flying for most of my 20s. And now I'm not afraid of flying anymore. And news events don't actually change that. Uh, so I think it's just sort of all around perception because, you know, we all know that when it comes to a rational perspective, you're more likely to die on your way to the airport than you are in flight. Um, but sometimes it's hard to force those statistics to override the anxiety that's in your brain. Yeah, that's not uh, how the amygdala works. <laughs> no, it's not. I, uh, I, I for sure, I was good until I was about 30 never bothered by flying and then i got real i've been very very ugh, since then yeah see i love flying time to time to pour some glasses of wine um but we're <laughs> gonna continue we're gonna continue tracking really the pops and pills. we're gonna take continue. an edible yeah we'll see no, if, not oh, that. I don't know how that would go that's gonna be that's gonna be a a repeat of um of bridesmaids jeffrey's gonna see <laughs> woman on a, the wing of the plane <laughs> But with that, folks, let's move on to good or bad use of survey design. Last Thursday, the Office for Management and Budget updated the way the U.S. Census collects information on race and ethnicity. Now, questions about race and ethnicity will be combined into one question where respondents can select all that apply instead of just one category, and Middle Eastern and North African descent will be added as an option. Previously, critics have taken issue with how both people of Middle Eastern descent and Hispanics are recorded in the census. People of Middle Eastern descent were instructed to mark themselves as white, and in the 2020 census, about 43% of Hispanics did not report their race or classified themselves as some other race because Hispanic has been included as an ethnicity and not as a race. These changes could result in some significant shifts in our census data and trickle-down effects in areas like legislative redistricting or health and socioeconomic statistics. And here, of course, at 538, we use census data often, so these changes will impact our work too. So for starters, Kaylee, let's begin with you. Is this a good or bad use of survey design? I think it's good. It's Overall, it's an improvement. I think that anytime you're making changes like this, there's going to be... <laughs> It's net. It's net positive. This is there's going to be things you lose and things that are more complicated because of it. But I think overall, this is a better step than the design that we had previously. Um, in you know, not having that ethnicity broken out as a separate section, having that option to have to put your sort of race and ethnicity all kind of together and check as many boxes as are appropriate for the individual, I think is going to get more precise data. Like like you were saying, you just quoted that huge group of Hispanic and Latino Americans who just were like other, you know, that's not useful data. That's not helpful um, to have them kind of just invisible in that way. And so that will be helpful. There are obviously uh, complications with it. Uh, I know that, you know, there was some concerns around people of different races who are Hispanic, Afro-Latinos, people like that, who maybe won't know which box to pick or will only choose uh, one and not the other. And that could kind of like uh, make it unclear uh, some of the breakdown there. And there's also some questions around the Middle Eastern North African category as well as who, who identifies as that, who it's going to include and who it won't. But I think overall, this is an improvement. And yeah, it's it's always tricky with race and ethnicity data. So much of it is so personal and subjective in a way. It's sort of how you identify and how you feel connected to a certain culture or a certain uh, place. So it's it's never going to be that easy to to get it accurate. And I think that this is an improvement overall. And it's one that a lot of people have been asking for. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, kind of like Kaylee said, um, this has been something that um, advocates have been pushing for, I think, you know, particularly on the, the kind of MENA uh, category, like those people who have and you're saying MENA is Middle Eastern, North African. Middle Eastern and North African. Those people were, were told basically like, you know, say that you're white. And obviously for a lot of those people, um, I, I don't think that accurately captures their, um, you know, the way, the way they think of themselves. And I think that a lot of advocates on that side are, are happy with it, um, uh, which is good. And, and yeah, I, also for uh, Hispanics and Latinos, like... It, I think it's always been confusing to the lay person that that has been separate as kind of evidenced by that large share of Latinos themselves who, you know, initially checked, yes, I'm, I'm Latino, and then saw it, went on and saw a race category, and probably a lot of whom said, like, wait, didn't I already answer this? Like, I consider my race to be Latino. So I think that is kind of, that reflects the fact that mo- a lot of Americans, if not a majority, think of um, Hispanic identity as more of a race than an ethnicity. So yeah, overall, um, you know, I think a a good change. Right. I think that's a little bit of the complication here, which is that if you use and understand these categories appropriately, they can make a lot of sense and they can help the way that it was before could actually give you more detailed information. So if somebody identifies as black and then checks Hispanic, or if somebody identifies as white and then checks Hispanic, they can be telling you something detailed about who they are. For example, in Latin America, there are a lot of people who are largely Caucasian and are descended of Spaniards or Portuguese or whatever, but they are also Hispanic because of the culture that they come from, the ethnicity, um, et cetera. So now you're kind of telling these people like your race is also also Hispanic, even if this person may be ostensibly white or ostensibly black. So that data gets a little complicated, but I think most people didn't understand the census to work that way, evidenced by the 43% of Hispanics who just said other. Uh, or don't know anyway. So I think if you understood it, it worked. If you don't understand it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Right, exactly. And I think that that the concern among um, like certain Afro Latino advocates is that basically the way it was before is that the the census kind of gave an extra nudge to um, Latinos in particular to like check to give more information about themselves to check multiple boxes. And now they're kind of on more of an even footing with everybody else. And like they can still check multiple boxes. And so I think a lot of this will come down to kind of like the like educational efforts that go around the census and, you know, making sure people understand that they can check multiple boxes and and hopefully do if that is kind of an accurate reflection of their um, of their race. But um, but yeah, I, I understand the, um, you know, like the num- the kind of number of Afro Latinos will probably appear to decrease between the 2020 and 2030 censuses. And I think something that people will need to bear in mind, you know, checking my watch here seven years from now when the data comes out, you know, so everybody just, you know, set a reminder um, is to just remember that changes in um, kind of measurement design can impact these numbers as well. And you don't, it's not necessarily going to be an apples to apples comparison. Well, that's the other key thing, Jeffrey, that I want to ask you about, which is the downside to making these changes and to making changes to any survey questions that you've been asking over a long period of time is that it makes it a lot harder to compare new data to old data. So what sticks out as potential challenges there? Well, as you said, like any time you change categories in terms of what options exist, it does complicate at least to some extent comparing historical data. So uh, for instance, If you're trying to understand how Latinos think of themselves uh, in like racial terms or what have you, the 2030 data and the 2020 data will come with a lot of caveats, like trying to compare those numbers. Um, And so that, you know, that's just like a small example. However, I would say that this has been true of the census basically throughout its entire history. (laughs) Like this is not a new problem. Uh, The census, yeah, the census like census questions and cat racial categories uh, have have changed repeatedly uh, in an effort to to more accurately gauge and sometimes uh, uh, other certain people uh, as a part of you know historically a country that has had uh, quite a lot of racism in terms of how we try to understand uh, people and who they are and try to categorize people but in order to other uh, segments of the population. So, uh, in terms of the language that's used, the categorizations that have been used, uh, we had a great piece on this actually back in 2021, um, by Jasmine Mathani and Alex Samuels that covered how the census 
census's racial categories have changed over time. And it's just, it really just shows you... Sort of a cultural history in and of itself. Precisely. And, and, and the ch- kind of changes that have been made have been, in, in more recent years, have been made with more of an idea of, let's really try to get like a more accurate picture. You know, for instance, they, uh, in, in 2000, they used to categorize like, Asian American and Hawaiian like together. And then they were like, okay, well, let's separate those. So that's why you have Hawaiian and Pacific uh, Pacific Islander as a separate category now from Asian American. Uh, so that's just like a small example. Uh, so, so I, you know, I feel like today the goal is definitely to try to get a more accurate picture in ye olden days meh, and, and not even that far in the, in the past. Uh, it wasn't always with that objective in mind. So I actually do think this is a good use of survey design because it is trying to get a more accurate picture of how people actually identify themselves. Right. And you can end up with kind of unexpected consequences. So like in 2020, um, when they changed the design around race and ethnicity, they, they had, they basically were like, check whatever boxes you want and also write, you know, add in more detail. So if you click, you know, check white, but your background is, you know, Scottish, German, and French, like add those in as well. And one of the weird things that happened or unexpected things that happened was the number of Americans who identified as Cherokee, like shot up a crazy amount. Um, Because a lot of, I mean, a lot of them were like white people who added Cherokee as like, you know, one of six identities because they believe that they have some kind of lineage there. And then that was taken by the census and like added to the Native American category. And so there's things that, you know, that I, I don't know that that was expected when making that design change choice. But I think one thing out of this that we can expect, I think an effort to get as sort of detailed or representative information about the American public as you can find is great. And of course, how we categorize ourselves changes as the culture changes as well. Like these changes today may in 20 years from now be seen as retrograde and a weird understanding of ourselves and mashing together race and ethnicity, while it may seem appropriate today based on people's understanding, may seem ill-advised years from now because those two things are actually different. But you know, one thing that I think about now in terms of how this perhaps good use of survey design could be turned into a bad use of data is when the survey comes out, I think people are going to compare the results to 2020 and make big claims about how America has changed in the intervening 10 years that aren't properly caveated. And so I think one of the things that will change is because now people of Middle Eastern or North African descent are no longer identifying um, or told to identify as white, or because you can check as many as apply, you will see the number of people who identify as strictly white decline significantly between 2020 and 2030. And whether you're on like the right or left part of the political spectrum, that means something to people in a partisan sense about who we are as Americans and how the country is changing. And people will probably make a lot more of that shift than is appropriate based on how the country has changed in pure demographic terms versus how we've changed in in the way that we identify. Does that make sense? It does, but I have more faith than you do. <laughs> you have more faith in the media in terms of how they're going to report on the census. Yeah, Kaylee, where have you? Where have you? Where were you in twenty twenty? <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I I think that probably most reputable news outlets will note the methodological change, but you know, it might happen in the sixth paragraph and probably a lot of people aren't going to read that and they're just going to see the headlines. And, you know, like it's just, you know, by then we're all going to be getting our news through like TikToks to, like directly implanted in our brains. So, um, you know, a lot of the nuance could get lost. It's all going to be written by AI anyway. So, <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting point, Galen, but I also think that at the end of the day, right, like hopefully, you know, I think that I believe, and obviously like the, the census folks believe like this is ultimately going to produce a more accurate picture of the nation. So, you know, as we stand, as the nation stands right now, it is probably less white than we currently kind of believe it to be, um, based on the way the census has been designed in the past. So we also use census data, not we ourselves, but the government uses census data to draw districts. Do you think this will change sort of how districts are drawn in the sense that um, minority opportunity districts are still required under the Voting Rights Act? Um, 
in terms of maybe folks will say, hey, we've got a district out in Los Angeles that is, you know, 40% Asian and it's 15% Middle Eastern, North African, whatever. Like we deserve our own sort of minority opportunity district where there may not have been the numbers before to make that claim. So I think, I mean, obviously we're going to get the data and we'll see, but like, I think that like Middle Eastern and North African people of, of that descent, um, there just aren't very many of them in the U.S. So I don't think that the numbers will shift that much. Um, like I, like they're, you're not going to see a district that is going to be like MENA opportunity, right? Because there, there just isn't, they don't have that kind of concentration anywhere, um, at least on the congressional district level. But um but yeah, like I do because, think. I mean, to put this in context of the conversations that we've been having, Michigan has the highest percentage of at least Arab Americans. It's two percent, and that's two hundred thousand Arab Americans. A congressional district is about seven hundred thousand people. So you can do the math, right? Um, yeah, but like most kind of Voting Rights Act districts are um, like black. Um, there are some that are Latino. Uh, I think that um, you know those numbers could shift in smaller ways, but I think that the, I mean, I, I think, I think that like true population growth will probably be more significant than the kind of measurement changes with, with those populations. All right. So good use of survey design certified by the 538 politics podcast with caveats and complications and make sure you get the data reporting right seven years from now, folks, we'll be on you. Uh, but anyway, let's move on and talk about how the parties are positioning themselves on abortion. Last Tuesday, the Supreme Court heard arguments regarding whether or not to limit access to mifepristone, an abortion medication that, according to Guttmacher Institute research, was used in more than 60% of U.S. abortions last year. Mifepristone was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2000, and in 2021, U.S. regulators made it possible to obtain the prescription through the mail. On Tuesday, the plaintiffs, Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, argued that the FDA unlawfully relaxed restrictions on mifepristone to make it easier to end a pregnancy and that mailing medication violates the Comstock Act. The 1873 Comstock Act states that it's illegal to use carriers such as the United States Postal Service to mail, quote, obscene materials. These obscene items at the time were defined as contraceptives, substances that induce abortion, pornographic content, sex toys, and any written material about these items. So be careful. Although I should say here that plenty of aspects of the Comstock Act were found unconstitutional. So if you want to keep writing letters to your lovers across state lines, go for it. Just want to get that out of the way. Um, Although I should stipulate that I'm not an attorney. Uh, anyway, <laughs> is it clear? Is it clear from the oral arguments? And I know that it's never clear, but did we get a sense of whether it seems like mifepristone is going to be limited as a re as a result of this Supreme Court case, Kaylee? I mean, the coverage that I've seen suggests no, but it kind of has more to do with the merits of the case itself and whether or not these doctors who refuse to even provide the service are somehow being harmed by uh, other people providing the service. I think it also would be kind of out of line with the Supreme Court's previous rulings, kind of kicking things back to the state to, to take this kind of overarching uh, approach. It's just, it's a really strange sort of uh, lawsuit that's different than the, you know, something like Dobbs um, in that it's like focusing on the FDA and whether it had the right to approve this medication, how risky it is, and whether that causes harm. Like, those are all, like, not super great arguments because there's lots of drugs that have some harm, and, like, Viagra is, like, much more dangerous than the abortion pill, for example, as far as, like, risk of death and other complications. So it, it just I, I feel like my understanding is that the arguments aren't quite strong enough for them. Got to get Viagra to the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> all rise. We are not attorneys here, um, but it did seem like the takeaway from the hearings were that it's unlikely that the Supreme Court is going to wade in here. Does anyone feel differently from that? I'm old enough to remember when the oral arg people read a bunch into the oral arguments and were like, oh, a certain justice is leaning this way. And then it turned out to not be that way. But I do think that these days, like the Supreme Court has basically become a partisan institution where 
their views are very clear. And this would be another, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure it would be on the level of Dobbs, but it would be a really massive decision if they decided to um, to kind of go aside with the um, kind of conservative side on this, because even in states where abortion is legal, suddenly a bunch it would be a lot harder for, for a lot of women to get abortions since medication abortions are a, a large proportion of the abortions that happen. So I think that there is, I'm sure there is an understanding among folks like John Roberts that this would be a very unpopular decision, as I think we'll mention uh, some polling in a bit. But um and that it would be kind of another blow to the Supreme Court's kind of like democratic credibility. And so I think that would will probably stay the hands of uh, some of the more pragmatic minded conservatives, um, you know, in addition to the fact that kind of they seemed legally skeptical of it at the arguments. Part of the problem, too, is that if they took the most extreme kind of response to this and, you know, so that the FDA didn't have shouldn't have approved it at all, that that would impact not only states where abortion is legal, but also the use of this drug for uh, like miscarriage, for example, when you have a miscarriage, sometimes not everything passes and you need to have a basically a medical abortion, but there's no living tissue inside that would remove that access as well, which is, I don't think any even pro-life people are asking for that. As far and you as would I know. also presumably make every medication approved by the FDA vulnerable. I mean, again, let's move on to the politics because we are not um, legal experts in this category. So when it comes to how Americans feel about this, according to a recent Axios Ipsos poll, 72% of Americans support access to abortion medication from one's doctor or clinics. Notably fewer, so 50% of Americans approve of the medication being mailed. And I'll add here, looking at the crosstops of just Republicans, 51% of Republicans support women obtaining the pills needed for a medication abortion from their doctor or clinic. That's the language in the poll, um, compared to 23% who support women receiving it through the mail. So there's overwhelming support for this medication, significantly less support for the medication being sent through the mail, but still a bare majority, um, or 50%, and then the, some don't know and some don't support. So at the same time, though, there are a good number of Republicans. So according to ABC News, 26 senators and 119 Republican representatives who support the Alliance for Hippocratic Medi Medicine in their Supreme Court case. So is it fair to say that the Republican Party's position is that mifepristone should not be used or what? Like where where are Republicans positioning themselves on this? this potentially quite unpopular position of not of opposing it. I mean, isn't this just another example of the confused positioning that they've generally had on abortion ever since Dobbs, <clears throat> where you will have Republican politicians sort of bouncing around from how they want to phrase their opposition to abortion uh, and just how general that opposition is. Uh, so, I mean, clearly there are many Republicans who just generally oppose abortion in all circumstances. And the fact that you could have basically half the Republican caucus signed on to that uh, in regards to medical abortion pills uh, is telling, I think. But at the same time, if you're thinking about just the politics of it, this has been an issue where they've been flat footed ever since the Dobbs decision. Like they've just they've been or they were caught flat footed. And now every time they try to shift uh, they, they've, they've been struggling to find sort of the right arguments. And, you know, you can even see this at the presidential level with Donald Trump trying to, uh, you know, in private saying what 15, 16 weeks is where he's, he's trying to land. Cause he knows this is like a really tough issue now for the GOP because it's been real. You basically have op opened Pandora's box on this issue. And so trying to nail down after, you know, having decades of sort of, uh, how things worked, responding to this this new reality has continued to be sort of in flux, I guess. Generally speaking, Trump, as the presumptive Republican nominee for president, doesn't want to talk about this because it's an issue where voters say that they trust Joe Biden. And that's not necessarily the case, like versus him. And that's not necessarily the case on a lot of issues, right? So the more that abortion is sort of front and center, the better it is almost certainly for Democrats and Biden. Yeah, I feel like that's really where the Republicans are 
positioning themselves in this election is like not wanting to talk about it at all if they can avoid it. Especially, I mean, the medication abortion is just like a non-starter when you have even a majority of Republicans saying that they're in favor of it. And I think that dip that you see with through the mail is just like an informational gap where people maybe don't understand that you're still get you still have to have a prescription and see your doctor. You can't just like go on Amazon and order some abortion pills and take them. It's still a medical process. It may also be people reacting to the understanding that if you can mail it across state lines, then you can access abortion more easily in a state where it's not actually allowed or under circumstances that wouldn't otherwise be allowed, right? So people might feel like, oh, you know, if you can mail it, you can get around regulations that states may be imposing, particularly if Republicans' position is that this is a state's rights issue. I still think that there's an information gap there. And I also think that part of the reason why this is so unpopular is because this is the, you can't use a medicated, you can't use the abortion pill past a certain number of weeks, or it depends on the doctor and the pregnancy and everything. But these are for those very early stage abortions that m- many more Americans are okay with versus later stage abortions in second and third trimester. And so this is like the one area where like it's the hardest to, to make that that argument and have people be on the same side. And even in states where they're they're passing bans, a lot of the times the bans are after a certain number of weeks where medication abortion would still be legal in those states. So Yeah. So to Kaylee's point, um, you know, we love our friends at Ipsos, but I think this this may have been a bit of a bad use of polling. Um so the the exact wording of these questions which were asked back to back was based on what you may know or feel, how much do you support or oppose the following? First, women obtaining the pills needed for a medication abortion through the mail. So this is the one that Republicans opposed and was evenly split national or among everybody. Then Women obtaining the pills needed for a medication abortion from their doctor slash a clinic. And this is the one that had strong support. And I think in reality, it is, it's both of those things, right? It's women obtaining the pills needed for a medication abortion with the kind of like from their doctor or clinic mailing it to them, right? Basically, or like telling somebody to mail it to them. And so, but I think the way that this was presented as back-to-back questions using similar wording, but then with different endings, suggests that these ideas are in opposition when in fact they aren't. So I wonder if each of those numbers is like maybe like an average of, I mean, I don't think you can literally just average it and call it a day, but like the true public sentiment on this issue may be somewhere in between those two numbers. And maybe then the the number that we want to look at that's, cleared a little bit from the complications of the survey design is that this exact same poll found that 65 percent of republicans support a federal ban on abortion at 15 weeks of pregnancy and 74 percent of republicans support a federal ban on abortion at 15 weeks of pregnancy with exceptions for rape incest and life-threatening emergencies which is to say that 75 percent of republicans seem to also accept abortion during the first trimester of pregnancy um, which is significant in terms of how this debate has been framed up until now. Yeah, it's, that's, of course, the challenge for the GOP is that the that there's a substantial portion of the base that would like to see abortion illegal basically in all circumstances, or nearly all circumstances, and and pushing for that. Uh, I, and we actually see this. I... I was looking at some polling from Fox News. The wording is slightly different on this, but for instance, about a year ago in an April poll from them, 54%, I think it was, supported uh, abortion at 15 weeks uh, overall. And of that, two-thirds of Republicans favored uh, a ban in their states at 15 weeks. But now today, that number who favoring it has fallen to 43% as of this month. Uh, with about 60% of Republicans saying that. Uh, so there's been a decline in support for banning at that 15-week mark and and also the six-week mark, because in that polling, they also asked about six weeks, uh, where it went from 44% favoring it to now 38% favoring it. So I think it's just like, as people have become more sort of informed and aware of this issue, as it's become just... A, a topic that is is top of mind when people talk about politics in a way where it used to be about should 
Roe v. Wade stand up is now it's like, well, what are exactly is like the line for all this for abortion being legal or not? And the state to state variation and whether there should be a federal ban has forced people maybe to pay more attention to the the specifics of all this. And I think also a little bit of what we're capturing here is the cha- are the challenges of specific policy polling and then applying that to electoral outcomes or something like that. So if you look at the policy polling, you could easily come to the conclusion that Americans, a majority of Americans support abortion in the first trimester and a minority of Americans only support it after the first trimester. And that has been true for a pretty long time if you try to sort of find where that marker should be. And Democrats' stated position here, or what they've been campaigning on so far, is reinstating Roe, which would be ensure that abortion is legal until fetal viability, which is around 24 weeks. But when you try to apply that information to electoral outcomes or a position that might be popular for the Republican Party to take, it doesn't really translate. And I think that's in large part because the vibes are bad. Americans don't trust Republicans on the issue of abortion. So no matter what they're saying, almost, if it includes ban, if it includes a certain number of weeks or whatever, people just don't trust the party. Whereas there are other issues on which Americans don't trust the Democratic Party. But on this specific issue, it almost is like finding for Donald Trump to be like finding the correct week for a national ban is maybe misunderstands how Americans view the debate altogether. I think that's right. Um, and, you know, Dobbs has caused a lot of people who maybe didn't have a strong feeling about abortion to reflect on it more seriously and, and report in polling that it's having more of an impact on their considerations for voting for president. So I think that that's just like a shift that the GOP maybe didn't anticipate or, you know, is trying to, to grapple with now, uh, if, if nothing else. All right. Well, let's wrap up with our final segment on the unpopularity of presidential candidates. So as I mentioned at the top, Trump and Biden, that duo, this election is only outdone by the Trump Clinton matchup in 2016 for being unpopular. And in basically every other election besides those two, at least one of the candidates has been above water with the public. So popular in net terms. And at times, even both candidates have been popular, like in 2008 and 2000, when I guess Americans looked at their option and said, fantastic, I'll take both. Also, this is an analysis that Nathaniel Rakich, you just published. And the question here is also, will this lead to more third party votes? And Jeffrey, you have recently done an analysis of where third party candidates are actually gaining access to the ballot. So let's start with the unpopularity factor. Nathaniel, I've described it in broad terms. Can you put some numbers just to where we are in terms of how unpopular these candidates are? Yeah. So right now, uh, Donald Trump's net favorability rating is negative 10 points and Joe Biden's is negative 15 points. And so um, together, if you average those together, it's negative 12 points because of rounding. And that is, as you mentioned, the second lowest uh, in history um, as of, I should state this is based in for past candidates. This is based on their favorability ratings just before the election. So obviously one Trump or Biden could become more popular. They could change. They could both become really popular. Yeah, I'm not betting on that outcome, but it's possible. If nothing changes, um, they would rank second to Clinton and Trump in 2016, who were, um, Trump was at negative 25 and Clinton was at negative 12 that year. Um, And so we are, obviously, I don't think this is going to surprise anybody. We are in this era of um, particularly unpopular presidential candidates. And in fact, you've seen just kind of like a shift overall kind of since kind of the Trump era. And I think it's an open question as to whether this is um, because of, of Trump himself or because of the era that we're we're in and whether this is going to be kind of a permanent feature going forward or whether we're just, you know, in this time when people are generally dissatisfied with the country and, and maybe with Trump personally. Um, but you had this situation where until 2016, no presidential candidate was double digits underwater. Um right before the election in terms of favorability. But now, uh, in 2016, both candidates were. In 2020, Trump was. Uh, Right now, it looks like maybe both of them will be again. So Americans just seem really kind of down on their candidates, which makes sense given that there you know, lots of people say the country's on the wrong track. There's a lot of dissatisfaction um, in general with the way things are going. Um, So I thought that was interesting. 
Should we expect, I mentioned that in 2016, 6% of Americans passed, cast a third party ballot at the top of the ticket, not particularly high by historical standards, but also high enough to make a difference in a close election. Should we expect a lot of third party votes as a result of this matchup again, or low turnout for that matter? The turnout question is interesting. I didn't look at that. Uh, maybe I should have. Um, I think, well, I think... Come on, Nathaniel. Historically, yeah, sorry. We can, we'll come back to it later. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, I should say, actually, that historically, that 6% like was high. I think in absolute terms, it's not high. And that just reflects the fact that like the two-party system in the U.S. is dominant. And even in a year when both presidential candidates are extremely disliked and third-party candidates do unusually well, the best they can muster is, is 6%. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if something like 6% happens again this year. I think that a lot of people, obviously, you look at polls these days and you see RFK Jr. in like the teens and people are like, ooh, um, but you have to remember as you know as Kaylee has written um and as we've talked about before third party candidates all, almost always decline in the polls as we get closer to the election as people kind of realize oh like you know this isn't the best use of my vote i should vote for one of the people who's actually has a chance of winning um and so yeah i think that like something that is relatively high compared to like the you know 2020 2012 2008 environment in terms of third party vote share i think we should be expecting that but i don't think anybody should be expecting like like a double digit performance the way that the current polls are saying. Right. And what, um, one of the patterns you see with these third party votes when you track it through history is like when there's an election where it does kind of creep up a little bit to that like 6% or 8%, typically uh, with kind of the exception of Perot, by the next election that drops down again because people are sort of like, oh shoot, like maybe maybe my third party vote meant my like second choice or the you know the candidate who lost didn't win or there was some kind of vote splitting there and so they they sort of doubled down on on voting for one of the two major parties in the following election now we're sort of two elections out from from that change so it could be it could kind of like bump back up especially with all the dissatisfaction but as a thing it was saying like it's it's really not that uncommon for third party candidates to be getting like around you know low double digit support this early in the election cycle a lot of that is just people kind of expressing their frustration and then when it gets closer to november you know they end up coming home because they start to get nervous about you know their least preferred candidate actually winning and you know with this election 2016 was worse but the, you know, the am amount of people who are like these double haters or people who, who dislike both candidates is, you know, higher than it has been in some years. But even when you drill down among those uh, voters and ask them who they would vote for, they usually pick Trump or Biden. <laughs> like, there's, I think, maybe like about a third of them say I would pick a third party candidate. And that's of the minority who already say they don't like either candidate. Most Americans prefer one or the other even if they, uh, you know, overall sentiment is that they're not doing so well. Kaylee, a significant difference this year compared with 2016 as well is that there is a third party option with high name recognition. God bless Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, but people just didn't know who they were in 2016. And so do you think that that changes the equation at all in 2020? T sorry, it's not 2020, in 2024. Um, I guess that's like, that is a bit of a more of an X factor with the name recognition, but I don't know, like Johnson didn't do too bad <laughs> by, by historical standards in uh, 2016. So uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I th I think maybe it would have a, a minor impact, but it's hard for me to imagine that that's going to be a defining this isn't going to be, you know, like a 92 or a 96 kind of situation, I don't think. Yeah, I sort of have two thoughts with Kennedy, uh, <clears throat> Robert Kennedy Jr. On the one hand, I think his polling numbers right now are particularly inflated because his last name is Kennedy. And there is a significant chunk of the electorate, particularly people who aren't very engaged, who are independent, who uh, will answer him uh, as their choice because they've heard that name and they don't like the fact they're, they're not excited about a Biden Trump rematch uh, or, or even unha very unhappy about it uh, and don't like either candidate. So I think Kennedy, because of his name recognition, is perhaps even more likely to sort of have that that inflation. At the same time, he's also raising more money 
than most third party or independent candidates have. Like he's already raised more than twice as much as Gary Johnson did in the 2016 cycle. Uh, so I think that RFK Jr. will have, and he just picked a vice presidential candidate who has a lot of personal wealth, if she's willing to throw a lot of that at the campaign, that he will have more means to try to get his message out. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that message is going to be <laughs> be one that a whole lot of Americans are actually receptive to by the time we get close to November. But I do think that having those means and having that name at the end of the day could make it more likely you could see him do something like win 6%. Like John Anderson won 6.6% 6 .6 in 1980. That's sort of the bar I've been looking at for what Kennedy does. Does he reach about that? Does he finish below it? Maybe he finishes above it, but maybe you're talking about a Perot-esque 8% or something in that case. But Well, Perot 96, Perot 92 is 19%. I, I know, but I'm talking about Perot 96, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. probably much more realistic than a Perot 92. Uh, so <laughs> Perot 96 might be RFK Jr.'s sort of uh, goal at the end of the day, even if it's not not uh, at this stage of 92 perot was pulling better than the two major candidates so this is a whole different scenario okay so well, i don't know on twitter people are telling me that rfk jr is going to break the duopoly so maybe it's going to happen i don't know Oh wow. okay logistically speaking in order for any of these candidates to get votes whether it's the libertarian ticket the green party rfk jr they actually have to be on the ballot and jeffrey you've looked into how far along these candidates are in terms of getting themselves on the ballot. So let's start with RFK Jr. because I think he's received the most attention. Where do his efforts stand and how likely does it seem that he will appear on everyone's ballot in the fall? Right. So good. Just to remind everybody, there's 50 states and the District of Columbia. So there's 51 total ballots you could be on <clears throat> in the presidential race. Right now, RFK Jr. is officially on one, which is Utah. Uh, however, that doesn't really reflect <laughs> where he'll probably be by the end, um, which is probably at 51 or just slightly below it. It, it. When I wrote the piece, it looked like there were seven other states where uh, RFK Jr., either his uh, this outside super PAC that's been supporting him was gathering signatures on his behalf or his campaign was doing it. And it looked like he was probably going to get on those state ballots. It's like New Hampshire, for instance, uh, some swing states like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada. Now, as to exemplify the difficulties of this, the Nevada situation has actually gotten a, a little more difficult for RFK Jr. because the Secretary of State office there was like, oh, hey, you actually needed to name your vice presidential choice on your on your petition papers, and you didn't do that. And the RFK Jr. campaign is like, well, we asked you and you said we didn't have to do that. But the statute as written says you do have to do that. And the Secretary of State Office is like, we're sorry that we told you the wrong thing. But the statute is what governs this, not what we told you. Um, so there's going to be litigation about that. Uh, to be clear, his campaign definitely still has time to get the like 10,000 some odd valid signatures you need. Uh like they have time to go back and do this over again. It would be annoying and it is expensive, but nonetheless, they could do it and fix the problem. Um, and I think this gets back to my discussion of like the means that RFK Jr. has at his disposal are much larger than most third party campaign operations. And historically, candidates who are sort of the most like a particularly notable third party candidate, like a Ross Perot in 96 or 92, a John Anderson in 1980, Gary Johnson in 2016, and even Joe Jorgensen, if you want to go to 2020, they got on all 51 ballots. Uh, so to me, it would seem like RFK Jr. would get on most in the end. So are any of the candidates at risk of not making it to enough ballots, at least to say win the presidential election? Well, of course, the only two candidates who probably have any chance of winning the election are Biden and well, Trump. Yes, of course. Uh, but yes, in theory... Uh, right now, only the libertarians have have confirmed enough ballot access to to, in theory, get a majority of electoral votes, 270. So they're they're on the ballot in like 36 states. And there's actually a couple more where they're just now it looks like they have what they need. So I'm basically my rough count is 38 out of 50, uh, 51 with D.C. So they're the farthest along. No labels is at about 23 states, more or less. <clears throat> and no labels plan, and of course they don't have a 
ticket yet, so that's a bit of a challenge. But their plan has been to get on the ballot as a party organization in 32 states and then let their candidates, like whoever they back, do the, the legwork in the other states. And I think this is a good opportunity to tell people in most states there are two ways to get on the ballot, either as an independent candidate, so you gather a certain number of signatures of registered voters uh, to meet whatever the requirement is to qualify for the ballot, or you qualify as a party organization. And so like Democrats and Republicans have that in every state because a lot of state laws are like the party with the most votes and the party with the second most votes qualify for ballot access. Uh, so convenient, right? Um, for for third parties, it then varies a whole bunch from state to state. And there are even some states where there's actually no way to be like a recognized political party or major party uh, without winning a certain percentage of the vote in the most recent election. Uh, but in a lot of states, if you just get like 2%, you could have ballot access like the libertarians hit that mark in a lot of states and that's why they're so far ahead compared to other other minor parties is they just have done better in more recent elections or maybe have need a certain share of registered voters to be registered under your party label mm -hmm. so those are like kind of the, the the ways about going about this but if you're like a no labels you've been gathering signatures in a lot of states or encouraging people to register under your party label in a number of states by a certain point by a certain deadline which again varies state to state in order to to hit the mark to be a party organization and have that ballot access all right well we're going to leave things there for today thank you nathaniel jeff and kaylee thank you thanks galen thank you, galen my name is galen druk our producers are shane mccann and cameron chertavian jayla everett is our intern and jesse demartino is on video editing you can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com you can also of course tweet at us with any questions or comments if you're a fan of the show leave us a rating or a review in the apple podcast store or tell someone about us thanks for listening and we will see you soon